on right now. If you hear me right now, God has been good to you. Because he got you here this morning. It wasn't nothing that you just popped up and said, I'm going to church. He placed that on your heart today to hear from heaven. Just like the Sunday school lesson says. They heard a word. The man, the man sitting by the gate heard a word. No money was given. But in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. So what's up on your mind today? In the name of Jesus, he said, give it to him. And he can take care of it. So as we continue in this call to worship, we are reminded that this is a time of prayer and praise to our Father. James 4 and 7 teaches us to submit ourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. To submit to God first. Resist the devil. And the promise is he will flee. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift our hands in humble submission to your will. We resist the devil. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask that you would cause Jesus to magnify himself in our midst. Amen. Patricia Fairbanks and her mother, 
Thelma Flannery, Brother Herbert Fitzpatrick, Sister Otha Frazier, who's here today, on her post over there, looking like she's looking. Brother Otis Glover, Brother Ivory Godwin, Sister Michelle Grooms, Brother Lennon and Sister Tammy Hackley, the Hill family, Vanetta Jackson, the jail ministry, Sister Dorothy Johnson, Brother Adrian and Stanley, Stanley Limbrick, Sister Phyllis Luckett, Sister Daphne Mitchell, Sister Hilda Myers, Sister Beatrice Porter, better known as B.B. Porter. Yeah, yeah. Brother Bentley Porter, Lawrence Raheem, Sister Brenda Sapp, Brother Earl and Sister Pat Shell, Deacon, Ralph Smith and family sitting over there looking distinguished as only he can. That's my big brother. Y'all don't want him to call your house and ask you where you at and what you doing. That tone of that voice will get you nervous. Oh, bless this holy day. Oh, man. Brother Richard and Sister Easter Sneed, Catrilla Stringfield, Dale Stringfield Jr., Shalithia Stringfield, Brother Michael Sutton, Sister Gwendolyn Thomas, Bobby Tucker Jr., Sister Hattie Wallace, good morning, Sister Songbird, Amen. Sister Jane Zetta Wallace, Brother Quentin Wallace, Kadik Williams, Linda Wright, Pearl Smith, Daisha Pearson, uh, Jeremy Pearson, the Jefferson family and the Pearson family. Pray for the Gibson family. Please, keep us lifted in prayer. Going back to my favorite text, I'll be reading this for a while, y'all. Y'all got to remember, I, I am, God's grace is sufficient for me. So I'm going to read it from the Psalms, not the Psalms, Lamentations. It reads, this I recall to my mind, Therefore, have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that I am not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Look at that. Boy, that's, that's my hope. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. In verse 26, it is good that a man should both wait, should both hope, and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. I'm looking forward to his deliverance. When it's coming, I don't know. But I know it's coming. I know it's coming. Father, we thank you today for Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, knowing that without him we can do absolutely nothing. Jesus declared, without me, you are nothing and you can do nothing. Even in the Sunday school lesson this morning, we saw it. That it was Jesus that was at work in the apostles. So we just thank you this morning for Jesus. You are such a gracious God and your word says that your compassions fail not. Your mercies are new every morning because you are faithful. We are weak, we are frail, we have our infirmities. But that's where we should rejoice because you said in your word, that I would rather boast in my infirmities so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So we're going to bow down. We're going to humble ourselves before your awesome hand. We're going to submit ourselves to you this morning. We're going to let you have your way in our life. Help us, Lord, and teach us how to serve you and how to love you. I pray is now that you will forgive us of our sins. And we confessing them now in our secret closet. 
that we are called it like you said. Because your word says your mercies are new every morning because you are faithful. So the prayer list, we have the prayer list and you know all about the prayer list. These are your people, Lord. These are your children. Have your way in their lives. Touch them. Strengthen them as only you can. Heal them if it's your will as only you can. Set them free from what's ever bogging them down because you're the only one that can do that. Help us to confess those things that are burdening us. Breathe on this prayer list, Lord, as only you can. So as we start this service off today, our prayer is that you will breathe on the St. Joseph family. That you will breathe on our pastor. That you will breathe on his family. That you will breathe on us individually and collectively and help us to bring that bond of unity that you are looking for. This be like oil running down Aaron's beard. So just touch us in a mighty way. Help us to love one another. Teach us how to love one another. Only you can do that. So just breathe on us. Save and add to your church today as such should be saved. This is our prayer. In the master's name of him that was dead but is of not alive forevermore, even Jesus our Christ. And let us all say together, amen and praise the Lord.
chapter 15 we've been instructed to read verses 51 through 58 a very very familiar passage of scripture again 1 Corinthians chapter 15 beginning at verse 51 through verse 58 
And when you have it, when you please signify by saying amen. <clears throat> Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immorality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brotherings, beloved, therefore, my beloved brotherings, be ye steadfast, unremovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Oh, bless the name. On this mother day, the flower fadeth, the grass withered, but the word of God shall stand forever.
can you even come behind that? As everything that God says to us, peace be still. Just stand and watch him. That's what he's saying to us. I am the guide in your life. I am the rule in your life. I am the Lord in your life. As such, I'm controlling everything that's happening in your life. Stand still and let peace be your comforter. And watch while I tear apart all this foolishness that's attacking you in this life. That's the promise that our Savior is giving us. Peace, be still. Not work, peace be still. It's a lot of our problems today. We think that we still got to work a part of this to get ourselves in glory. And Jesus says, I've done it all. Even on the cross, his last words were, it is finished. Not looking for a single thing from any of us to secure our salvation. It's a done deal. And God, to show proof positive that everything that he set out for his son to do on our behalf, it was completed perfectly. That's why in his holiness, God raised his son from the dead. Proof positive that all he wants us to do is be still and enjoy the peace that he will give us in our hearts and watch what I will do on your behalf. That's our God. That's our God. Father, we thank you for this day, this beautiful Mother's Day. We thank you, Father, for it is you who brought about the mystery of motherhood. Mankind has tried to figure it out, but we have not been able to figure it out because it's a, it's a mystery, and it's your mystery. And so, Father, we just thank you for in that we see ourselves living on and on through the joy of our children. Blood, b mothers are blessed to a mighty extent when they see their children grow up in the admonition of the Lord. When they see them with the, with the honor in their hearts to recognize you as Lord of their lives. What a beautiful, beautiful thing that is that you give us. Thank you for the mothers. And Father, we thank you for the men for we know without them that motherhood would be, would not, would not work. So we thank you for all that you do to bring about this joy, this mystery, this thing we call motherhood. Bless us today in your word as we look as to how you want us to rejoice in what you have done. Bless us now. For it is indeed in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And praise the Lord. Happy Mother's Day to, to everyone. What a wonderful day. This is a day that I believe that the world system say sometimes outshine even Christmas. You know, fathers, we get a etta boy. <laughs> and that's, that, that's about all we get. But I, I thank God for that. At least they recognize that we're, we're in a house somewhere, you know. But mothers, you are lifted up. You know, even if you stop and thought sometimes, really moment by moment, the death venture that you go through in bringing a life into this world, 
you know, at one time in history, that was a leading cause of death in this in this country and around the world. It's through childbirth. You know. But no one ever talked about that. No one ever really pushed that up. No one ever gave you the honor that you deserve as you bring life into this world. So it's a joy that, that God gives us. It's a privilege that he gives us and a blessing that we receive from all of that. So God bless you. I know I thank my wife for the two wonderful boys that I have. You know, they're, they're my joy. And I pray that God will continue to bless them so that a day will come to where they will truly, truly be mirrors of who their father is and be able to have a spot in this world to where they can bless, where they can serve, where they can honor God and, and what God has done in their lives. Thank you, sweetheart, for my, for my boys. Thank you. Give an honor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to the men that are here with me, uh, Reverend uh, Gibson and Reverend Fisher, to the deacons of this, this great church, God bless you in all that you do. To the, to the deaconess, what, what, what can I say? I'm telling you what, they are really demonstrating to us what fellowshipping is really about. I'm telling you, they are doing a, a wonderful job. Oh, as Pastor Rim used to say, a Herculean job. You know, yesterday, you all should have seen it. I mean, you know, 90 women in one spot, you know, and they ran every man that, <laughs> that was there out of there. And they were enjoying themselves so much, I was in my office, down the hall, round the corner, through a door, and then through another door. And I could hear them laughing and rejoicing, and I'm saying, I wonder if they're okay in there. But I didn't see no stretchers coming by or nothing, so I figured that they were just having themselves a good time. But if you weren't there, you really missed missed a fellowship. You really did. And uh, I thank God for that. I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to get on that wagon right now because I'd be for a while because it, it just blessed my heart seeing God touching their hearts in fellowshipping in the way that they were, were doing. Well, what a beautiful, beautiful Beautiful thing it was. To uh, the ushers, never want to overlook you. Thank you for what you do. <laughs> to the multimedia ministry, being led by little Bobby Tucker. There you go. Keep him in line, my little brother. You're doing a great job. <laughs> hey, man, that's my fellow, I'm telling you. To the hospitality ministry, to all ministries that are involved in the midst of this, of this worship. God bless you. To you, St. Joseph, as a family, you are one of a kind. You are one of a kind. What a joy it is to serve you. And I pray that God will continue blessing the way that he's doing. Then to my family, to my sweet mother-in-law, whom I love so dearly. She didn't think I'd see her sitting back there looking around. To uh, my brother, good to see you and your wife. God bless you. To my, again, lovely wife, I bring you joy and greetings from the Lord. We do have a word today from God. And it was quite interesting how God did this today. Sister Cheryl probably could tell you in more <laughs> a different way than I can go, but the strangest thing, God gave me this message about two weeks ago, just as clear as it could be, and I had it, you know, written down and in my little red book. And so it dawned on me, uh, I don't know whether it was Monday or Sunday of last week, Monday, I think it was, that this was going to be Mother's Day. And I said, oh, man, I need to put together a Mother's Day sermon. You know, so 
I'm sitting there, and boy, I'm struggling like you wouldn't believe trying to put a sermon together. Normally, I don't have anywhere near that kind of an issue. It just, nothing would sink. Nothing was blessing my spirit. It just wasn't speaking to me. And I spent the, the big part of most of the days last week, and I think uh, Thursday it was, and I'm sitting there and I said, well, I don't know. I'm just going to have to depend on you to just give it to me when I walk in the pulpit or whatever. Then I looked over in my little red book that was open and saw the scriptures and saw the sermon that I had prepared. And I'm saying, my Lord, here it is right here. He gave me this two weeks ago, not even recognizing that it was Mother's Day right in front of me. And the only thing that I had to do in that was to just change the pronouns. And I'm saying, Lord, this is, you know, you, you, you are, uh, are so wonderful. And I came and told uh, Cheryl, Sister Walker, my uh, administrative assistant, you know, I said, God is so mean and so stubborn. <laughs> she said, what you mean? I said, he wouldn't let me know right up front what he was doing. He let me struggle all this week really fighting against him, trying to put together something I want to put together, but he wouldn't release me to do it, you know, and therefore showing his stubbornness by sticking to what he want his people to hear, you know, and all I could do was just, just really just praise him, you know, for it was another situation for him to show me that he is God, and that when he speaks, that's what he wants said. Not what I want to put together, but what he wants to be done. And so that's the sermon that, that we have today. Now, one of the things that you're going to look at and see, first of all, looking at the scripture, it sounds like a sermon we would have at a funeral. If you really listen to it, you know, that, that's what it sounds like. And then we were sitting here, and then when you guys stood up and peace be still, I'm saying, well, Lord have mercy. That sounds like a song that we were singing at a funeral, you know. So, <laughs> you know, the Lord is so beautiful in how he orchestrates things. But the, the sermon that he has for us today, the, the title of it is, Your Labor is Not in Vain specifically talking to mothers. Your labor is not in vain. For God sees every single thing that you do in, in not only bearing your children into this world, but as you struggle with them day by day, as you cry your hearts out in the middle of the night, as you try to guide them and instruct them in the right way to go, you know, that God is not overlooking what you're doing. Two things are going to happen. God's going to bless you for your faithfulness. But the beautiful thing of it is he promised that with your babies, at some point in life, if they have strayed away or walked away, that they will come back to where you were teaching them and talking to them. Don't worry that the devil is going to be able to grab them up and take them off. God has promised you that if you do your due diligence, if your labor is teaching them and showing them the Lord Jesus Christ, God says that it will not be in vain, for they will return to what you have taught them, to who Jesus is, and what purpose he has in their lives. Verses 57 and 58. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved mothers, <laughs> I, I put that there. Yeah, I wrote that in your Bibles last night when you weren't looking. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, 
always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God is smiling upon you whether you realize it or not. You need to stop letting this world cause you to moan the way that you're going thinking that they have won in the life of your children. If your due diligence from their birth on is teaching them Jesus, if, if you've been sure that they were in church school, Sunday school, and in, in areas to where the Lord was being taught, if, if you placed in their minds that Jesus is the way and the only way to, to God Almighty, God has promised you that your labor is not in vain. Mothers, remember, even when you find yourselves at the end of your labor, Christ wants you to know that you are never beyond his reach. Jesus always despair to come into your lives sometimes so that he can show you that your labor in him will always be rewarded. Are you beyond hope today as you labor in his word with your children? I'm, I'm, I'm sure that some of us are, you know. Even my babies, as I love them so dearly, they are enjoying the world. They, they know the Lord Jesus Christ, but they're enjoying the world. And, and, and mama cries at night and, 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 and you know, and, and I look at her and say, you know, baby, why are you hurting your heart so much? Because God's in control. We've done our due diligence, you know, because they're not preachers up in the pulpit, you know, they're not Sunday school teachers, or they're not showing what we want to see as what we call good Christians. In their hearts, they know the Lord Jesus Christ. They know him. They cannot deny it. They know him. And so with that, with the labor that you have have done throughout the years, God is not winking at it. He has not forgotten what you have done and to young mothers what you are doing. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches us that as young mothers, that even when your babies are young, you know, teach them the scriptures. Write them on their foreheads. You know, uh, uh, write little notes and pin it to their jackets. You know, you may not want to be that extreme, but the point that the Bible is saying, don't let it be a small thing as far as teaching them the words of God. Because when you do that, they will always remember. Science has proven, science has proven that from the age of birth to the age of six really determines the destiny of a child. They remember more during those six years of their life than they will in further years. They can learn a complete language in, in, in less time than we can learn to drive an automobile. Their, their minds are set in that way. When we grab them at that young age, when, when we embrace them and encourage them to, to know their savior at a young age, Trust the Bible when God says that it will never be forgotten. That he will, when time is ready, bring it back to their remembrance. Are you worn out and tired of crying because of the loss that you sense has come in their lives? Because that's all it is, a loss that you sense that has come into their lives. For in their lives, Christ is alive, and he's going to be guiding them even though you may not be able to see it. There are certain ways that God is doing stuff, even in your lives, if you stop and think about it, that cannot be seen outwardly, but God is truly doing it in your lives, moving you in a direction and a purpose that he has for you. You cannot judge by what you see as far as what God is doing in the life of your babies. God loves them more than you do. Because he says that I died for them. 
so that they would have the safety of knowing a savior. So they, they would have someone that would be closer to them than a friend. Someone that would aid them and embrace them when they're in need of, of, of a parent when we are not around. That's what Jesus does. As a matter of fact, Jesus should be more closer to them than you are, mothers. I, I know that's a cold thing to say because you want to be to your babies the, the ultimate, the ultimate parent, the, the one that is that, that they will go to quicker than anywhere else. But Jesus says, no, I want that spot. I want that spot. Even you become second to me when it comes to the love of your children. But God says and he promises you that in doing your due diligence, then your labor will not be in vain. That even in your lifetime, you'll see the results of the work that you placed in their lives as they were growing up. Mothers, are, are, are you thinking about, about letting go because your hope seems to be gone? Or, or, or are you ready to say, I've done everything that I can do and, and I can't think of anything else that's going to work. I'm just letting it go. God is saying to you clearly, no, you never let go. But you put your trust, take it away from yourself, and you put your trust in me. It, it, and that works at any level. You know, I told my wife when we were married, I think we were married maybe about, uh, well, it was, was it within the first five years. Uh, I was working with Bell South and I was doing a lot of traveling, especially to engineering schools and, and all of that. And brother, you know what that's like, you know, being an engineer. They're always updates to new technology and so forth. So, and one of the places that, that they used to send to was the biggest school we used to call Beastie which was out in Denver. That was a huge engineering complex. And so we were, we were newly married. And, and, and you can imagine, you know, here, you know, uh, my wife, young, and, and having a, a handsome, debonair husband and, and, and all, you know. And, and here, here I was, you know, way out there in, in Denver to a school and so forth. And, and so I could hear in our heart the you know, the kind of, not, not jealousy, but concern. And so I told her one time, I said, sweetheart, look, you know, don't trust me. And boy, I shouldn't have said, I shouldn't have let that be the opening statement. Because it took me a while to get past that opening statement to get to what I was trying to say to her. And, and I says, your trust should be in Jesus. Because my profession, not only to Jesus, but to you as well, that, that he's my everything. He's, he's my God. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. Your prayer should be that Jesus will continue being my, my guide. Therefore, no matter where I am, then my actions would be predicated upon how he was directing me. And then I went to the human side. I said, now, and this was before you know, all the telephone features where... Now, you can't tell where a person's calling from. They can be in Egypt, and you think they're at home in the bed somewhere, you know. But back then, you know, you're looking at the phone, you can see, that's my phone number from home. So I know she's in Jacksonville, Florida, at home. You know, Here I am, six hours away by flight time. You know, I says, now, I just talked to you. Even if you got the car ready, it take you four to five minutes to drive to the airport. And if the plane is ready to take off, when you get there, it's going to take you then six hours to fly to Denver. And then where we were staying was, was near, uh, almost near Breckenridge, near Ville, Colorado. And so from the airport to the complex was another hour and a half. I said, now, if it was in my mind to do something I had no business doing, I had plenty of time to do it, eat dinner, clean up, put on a new suit, and then welcome you when you got there. So physically, your, you know, what you are trusting don't work. Where you have to put your trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
that indeed since my profession that he's my Lord, that God will keep me tightly in his care. And you know what? From that point on, there was never any sign in her voice or anything else that sound a little concerned or a little jealous. Because truly, she, she learned that as far as our marriage is concerned, trust had to be everything. And not in me. Not in me. Don't, don't miss that. Not in me. Because as being a male, being a human being, being flesh and blood, still capable of doing anything that, 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 that can be displeasing to God. It's only because of him that keeps your mind together, keep your heart together, to keep your priorities together, that you can be the person that God has called for you to be. Now knowing that, that's the same thing we have to remember about our children. The same thing. They, 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 they are capable of doing anything. Don't, don't look at your baby. I, I look at mass murderers and the mother. My baby could have never done that. You know, 15 people dead and seven or eight wounded and blood splattered everywhere. Just horrible. And my baby couldn't have done that. Humans can do anything. Human beings are capable of doing anything. Your trust has to be in the Lord Jesus Christ and recognizing that he's the one that's keeping things together. And with that, stop burdening your children with your distrust so much. Sometimes we can push them near the edge because when they look, they say, well, mom don't trust me no way. You know, no matter what I do, I'm getting accused. So like the world's going to tell them, just do it and enjoy it and take the consequences later. So we don't want to be the cause that they go near the edge. We want to be the ones that's praying to the one who is truly in control that, they, that he would keep them within the envelope. That's where our prayer and our trust needs to be. Let me tell you about the promises of Jesus. Jesus says, I'm always watching you, and I'm always watching your children. I'm the one who can keep them where they need to be. Put your trust and your prayers in Jesus. Trust that he will be the one to guide them. But your due diligence is to teach them about him. If you haven't taken the time to do that, then they don't know who their guide really is. You know, sometimes when we're talking to people, they, they can be so busy saving the world or leading the world to Jesus and at home looks like a rattlesnake nest. They miss the fact of teaching it at home because they don't feel that they're qualified. They don't, you know, it's, it's too familiar to them. And they, they, we forget to do our due diligence at home while we're doing everything outside in the world to, to help people and our poor children are going to the wayside. Our, our evangelism efforts, our teaching efforts need to start at home before we step outside. If all of us took the job of teaching at home, there won't be too many to step outside the guide because the, the, the teaching has already been given. But we miss doing that because we don't trust God and we don't believe that our labor is, is amounting to anything. We think ourselves that what we have done has all been in vain and God says it hasn't. He says in his word three things. He, said, he says first to be steadfast. The second thing is always abounding. And the third thing is to be confident. Steadfastness, always abounding, and be confident. 
Standing still in the strength of Jesus is where God wants each and one of us, each one of us, and especially in our parenting. We need to stand steadfast because when we start wavering, then it causes those whom we are trying to instruct to waver. Whenever we are on this point one moment, and then we are, we are coming from that, and on this point with the same thing in mind the next moment, our children don't know what to do. Jesus says to us to be steadfast, to be steadfast, unmovable. Don't, don't jump from this to that and to this to that. Jesus is specific in what he teaches us. And he wants us to be specific with our children. I know that in our hearts sometimes we feel, well, well, I just want them to enjoy life. Well, if enjoying life is forgetting about Jesus, then you are not teaching them what the Bible says. Because you don't begin to enjoy life until you know the Lord Jesus Christ personally as your Lord and Savior. That's the only way that you can begin to enjoy life. Then he says, as he's telling us to be steadfast, he says, be steadfast, unmovable in your faith. In other words, don't let your faith, don't, don't let it waver. Sometimes, see, your children haven't grown to the point of having their own faith developed yet, so they look to you. And if you are wavering, if you are moving from here to there and church hopping, church jumping, and one, one day I'm, I'm this, the next I'm Holy Ghost filled and speaking in tongues, and then the next week I'm slain in the spirit, and the week after that I'm on the mourner's bench, and all over the place in the midst of your faith, your children see that, and, and to them it's a sense of wavering. They don't see the, the steadfastness, so if they don't see the steadfastness, they don't see the real purpose in learning it. Jesus says, do not be unmovable in your faith. Be steadfast. Now, that doesn't mean being mean. See, some of us are saying, yeah, that's right. I'm steadfast. My foot is down, and I don't change my mind. I've seen more, especially young boys, harmed by that, that mentality. My father, I didn't know my grandfather that well, I, but I, I ministered and talked to other people. Uh, my father, when he made a decision, he stuck with it, even if he was proven wrong. That is horrible. That is horrible. That's not the steadfastness that God is talking about. God is talking about being steadfast in your faith as you know him. Hello? Oh, oh that's not for me. Be immovable in your faith. Be steadfast in your belief and trust in Jesus. Trusting him only. Not yourself. What makes sense to yourself winds up being foolishness to God. God says for us to be steadfast in the midst of our own beliefs as we have been instructed by the Bible. Not by stuff we see on TV and this kinds of stuff, but what the Word of God says. Be steadfast and unmovable. And when you do that, your children will see that, and then they will start to holding to your teaching more so because they see that you are always on point. That if wrong is wrong, then tomorrow wrong is still wrong. Doesn't change because you feel differently. Because there are a lot of them you talk to, well, Mama felt bad today, and she said that I couldn't, but she'll feel better uh, by Wednesday, and I can do it. They really believe that, and they really sense that because it's really true. But if wrong is wrong on Monday, it should be still wrong on Wednesday. The Bible says that as we learn of God, then we are to show his position, his steadfastness in the life of our children. Number two, he says, be always abounding, always abounding, always doing with joy things that please the Lord always doing with joy things that you know that please the Lord. We as believers, we as humans, we must practice, we must practice our relationship with the Lord. We must practice in how to be a Christian. See, God has saved us. That's good and fine, but we don't become a Christian until we become a follower of him. 
until we become learners of him. Then we become Christ-like, Christian. We become Christians. And God is saying to us, as we become believers, and as you learn of him, the Bible says, do it with joy. Do what he's commanding you to do with joy. Love each other. Love God. Love being around each other. Learn from each other once God has shown you that truly you are of the same spirit, of the same heart. He does not want us connecting together with the enemy. He wants us connecting together with those of like minds, like hearts. And when we do that, he says, do it with joy so that others can see it. When your children see you with joy, loving the Lord and doing what's right in the presence of the Lord, they will start to seeing that and taking that as a milestone in their lives and moving in that direction. But if they don't have anything to follow, then they're going to choose the way of the world. They're going to choose what YouTube tell them to do, what TikTok tells them to do what other apps tell them to do because they don't have that instruction from their mother, from their father. And the reason I keep saying that is because the Bible, true enough, put the teaching of the children in responsibility of the mother. Doesn't relinquish the responsibility of the father, but the Bible teaches us that since the mother is the closest to them as far as nurturing and so forth, that's where the basic teaching comes from. So you have an awesome job, mothers, and again, please don't think that I'm dismissing the fathers because God's going to hold them responsible for what you don't do. Don't miss that, men. God's going to hold you responsible for what your wife do not do that God wants them to do in the rearing of your children. So you have an even stronger responsibility because God is going to be holding you responsible. Always abounding. God gives us victory over sin and death. And so that in itself should be a joy that we are enjoying, knowing that we will never have to face the sting of death. You know, when I read the Bible and I see that over and over and over where God has taken the sting of death away, it tells me that there is an everlasting joy, and I don't ever have to worry about any type of turmoil or, or any, anything, because even at the point of what we call death, it becomes just a transition from this life to the next. There, there is no horrible issues, that kinds of stuff. God is there to greet us. He doesn't leave that to angels. Get this mess out of your mind about angels are leading you to the presence of the Lord. That's not in the Bible. What Jesus says is that he will lead you or present you to himself. He will guide you to himself because he is God. He is God Almighty. And we should be abounding in that, rejoicing in that, and let our children see that we're rejoicing in the fact that we are new creatures and we don't have to be afraid of death. We don't have to be afraid of of, of what's going to happen, that there's going to be everlasting love because that's what God has, has promised us. When we abound in the truth of the word, then God has promised to protect us. He's promised to keep us. I don't know how he does it. Matter of fact, I don't even know why he does it. The Bible just says that he loves us so much that he will protect us and keep us when we are abounding in his love. When we are being guided by his love and loving him and loving each other, God has promised that he will be all present in our life, that he will be there for us. He will guide us. He will talk to us. He will protect us. He will do all that is needed to keep us as his child. In the same way that, that you wouldn't get upset with your 10-year-old and put him out of the house and, and, and take the key from him is the same way that Christ will not do us that way. Matter of fact, he said that he saved us when we were yet dead in our sins. He didn't wait for a date when we started being good to save us. The Bible said 
that he says that he saved us when we were yet in the middle of our sins. That's how much God loves us. And, and lastly, he says to us, be confident, knowing that what you do for Christ will stand. That, that's a confident, knowing that you don't ever have to worry that that will be taken away from you. Now, that ain't going to make much sense until you get in glory. Then all of a sudden, that's going to mean more than money. The fact that what you have done in the name of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, is going to stand for you, and it's going to lift you, and it's going to encourage you. Our confidence is knowing that Christ rules our lives when we submit ourselves to him. He's a God that's, he, he's a gentleman. He will not force himself upon us. But what he says to us, he says, submit yourself unto me, and then I will do all these things in guiding you. I will be the one who, who show you where the danger is. As a matter of fact, I'll be the one who will move you away from issues that will destroy you. Even at times when you don't even know that it's happening. God will be there to keep the evil away from us if we would just submit ourselves to him. Be confident. Be confident that Jesus has worked everything out for you. That's what he's saying, mothers. Don't, don't worry that you haven't finished the, the mother book of success. There is no such book as that. Don't, 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 don't worry that you haven't gotten your degree in, in, in child beating or, or other things that you think that's necessary to raise in a child because it don't exist. As a matter of fact, the world system says, do not chastise your child. Because if we catch you chastising them, we're going to be chastising you. You know, that's what the world system says. But God says that if we be diligent in his, by his word in rearing our children, that we can be confident that he's going to be our defender. We don't have to worry about uh, the world attacking us or, or, or destroying us because we will be guided by he who saved us, who has saved our children, who has given us a purpose to be parents and given your children a purpose in their lives in something or some way in the kingdom of God. Be confident. Jesus is always interceding for us in heaven, always. That's where he is, sitting on the right hand of the Father, interceding. What does that mean? When we don't teach what we think is right, God is stepping in and making the difference. You know, what your children will hear when your heart is set on teaching them the right way or teaching them the way of Christ is that what you overlook or what you forget, Jesus is there to fill in the gaps in their minds and in their hearts. Jesus will be a parent alongside you. But do not leave him at the door. Have him with you when you're instructing your children, when you're embracing them. And I'm going to tell you something. When we do that, we can be full of joy knowing that the end product is going to be a child of God that's going to wind up being parents who are going to wind up teaching their children the same way. The same way that we go about instructing our children will be the same way they will do theirs. Whether they, they think it or not, that's how they're going to go because that's how they know. And so you can always be proud of the fact and be confident in the fact that if you are rearing your children the way that God has instructed you to do so, that you don't have to worry about the end result because God has promised in his word that if you do your due diligence, if you raise them the way that he's telling you to do so, that don't worry what you will see in the middle of it. He says, because the end result, they will return to me. That's his promise to you. And you can be confident in that. And you can abound in the joy that comes along with that. And you can be steadfastly full of joy knowing that God has the final answer. That's what he's promised each one of us, brothers and sisters. And he's not one to lie. He's not one to lie. And so being a mother means everything in the world to the world because it's you who prepare them for the world. And depending on how you prepare them is how the world is going to receive them. 
So teach them about Jesus. Mold them to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. It might be a little extra work, but I'm going to tell you something. According to the Bible, you will benefit at the end. Mothers, trust the fact that your labor will not be in vain. And I, it's, it's, it's too bad, I guess, in a certain sense that Jesus put that thought with that scripture because it sounded like we were going to a funeral. But I'm going to tell you something. The reason why that's the case because in some of your lives where your children have carried themselves and carried you, it feels like you're about to go to a funeral, your own funeral. It can hurt so badly until it feels like they're saying the last rites over you. Sometimes it hurts so bad until you can't even think of a way to even ease that hurt. But, but trust God in the fact that if you do like he's instructing you to do, that he will make up the difference. He will make up the difference. I'm sorry about the mic. Seems like it popped off right at the thing. But, but just trust God. Trust God. That's the Holy Spirit saying that's enough. I'm just saying. Just remember this one thing, that Jesus died for you. He did. He died for you because he knew that you didn't know how to be a parent. He knew that we would not know how to prepare our children for the end. He already knew that. He knew that there would be no way for, for your children to know about a Savior if there was no example of who a Savior is. So he came into this world over 2,000 years ago. He was not a father. He did not birth any children. He became adopted father of all of us. So he, he has a bigger household than you can ever think that you have because we all belong to him. He is our, our Father. He is God Almighty in the flesh. But he walked this life with all the temptations facing him that a parent would have. And the Bible says that as he faced it, that he did, he, he, he did not sin in the front of all those temptations. He did not sin. Some of his disciples were so bad in their actions, I'm sure he felt like putting a bullet in him. But he didn't do so. I'm saying that to say that temptations that we face and the degree of that temptation that we face, he faced the same thing. But he did not commit sin in the midst of those, those temptations. But yet they still took him to Calvary. They, they guided him to Calvary, I would rather say, because God said, I took my son to Calvary. I took him there because he had to pay the sin penalty of, 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 of sin for this world. And he was taken there. And the Bible says that, that uh, as our sins were laid upon him, that as they nailed him to the cross, that's where each one of us should have been. Because he took our place at that cross at Calvary. And he didn't say a mumbling word as he lay there because he knew that he was doing it in our place. That's what a father, that's what a mother would do for their child. They would die for their, their child. I know some of you would say, I wouldn't die, you know, and yes you would. Being a mother that is instinctively placed in your heart, if, if you were ever put in that position instantly in your mind, you would give up your life for the life of your child. And that's what Jesus did on Calvary's cross, knowing that if he didn't do it, that we would not have the joy of having eternal life, that our destiny would still be in hell. But on that cross, he was nailed. And he was lifted up, and the world saw him as he was on that cross. As a matter of fact, one of the things that happened as, as he was on that cross dying, a centurion, uh, one who didn't know anything about him, uh, one who was lost, if you would say, one who was basically the devil, as you would call. He looked up and he said, you know, uh, adding a couple of words, that the way this man is dying, he says, this must be the son of God. Someone who had no idea what that even meant made the profession in the way that he was dying that this must be the son of God. 
But on that cross, he died, knowing that he must die if he was to take care of our sins. And after he died on that cross, he was taken off and he was taken to a tomb that was borrowed. And he was placed there. And there his body lay for three days and three nights. That's the gospel according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. On, in that tomb his body lay. And the Bible says that he was in the heart of the earth, reconciling things back to the Father, putting it back to where God would be receiving his children back to him. And after three days and three nights, he had completed everything that God wanted him to do because to prove satisfactorily that he had done so, the Bible said in the holiness of God, he raised his son from the dead, bodily and alive, bodily and alive. And brothers and sisters, we have the joy of knowing that with our submission to him as our, our, our Lord, as our Savior, that eternally, we don't have to wait till death. We are right now living in eternity. That for eternity, we will always be in his presence. We will always have the love of a mother in the, in, in the way of Jesus Christ. The love of a father, the love of a savior, the love of our Lord. He is everything to us if we would just receive him as our savior and as our Lord. And as the gospel continues, the gospel says that uh, after he was there on his earth for 40 days and 40 nights, presenting himself to, to witnesses all over, the Bible said that even at one time, he presented himself to over 500, proving that he was indeed raised from the dead bodily and alive. But then after 40 days, the Bible said he ascended into heaven. And there he sits on the right hand of the Father, where he is interceding for each one of us. So we don't have to have that worry if you're concerned about, am I teaching my child right? If you have the Bible in one hand and God in your mind, that you are because God will stand in the gap. He will be sure that what you are teaching will be what's coming from his heart. So today, so today, my brothers and sisters, the choice is, do you know him as your Lord and Savior? Because if you do, then you do have the power and you have the wherewithal to be able to teach your children, to mold your children, to, to guide your children in the way of the Lord, to where they will have a life that they can enjoy knowing that they are in the presence of God. But if you don't know him in the pardon of your sins, then you do not have the wherewithal to guide your children correctly. You cannot be assured that your child will not be a problem for society rather than a blessing in society. But if you know him, then you have the joy of being confident, abounding, abounding, and, 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 with, and with steadfastness in your spirit that your labor in your parenthood, in your motherhood, is not in vain. Today, if there's someone who is in the need of a savior, if there's someone who needs the, the, the help of, 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 of our Lord and Savior to guide them as a parent and to guide them in their life, I present to you Jesus the Christ. Only he can do that. But it all begins and is predicated upon you receiving him. He does all the work. He's finished the work. All he wants you to do is to receive what he's done in your heart. It's a shame to have a million dollars in the bank and, and dine of, of, of hunger and won't write the check. That's where you are if you don't know Jesus and the pardon of your sin. You have everlasting life that has been put in the bank for you, but you won't even write the check to receive it. Why don't you receive this Christ that I preached about today? Why don't you come? Why don't you come? 
Then, on the other side of that invitation, there may be someone here today who do know, know Jesus, who have, have been saved for years and know for a fact that you are a child of God, but do not have a church home. The Bible says clearly in the book of Hebrews that, 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 that he does not want us to be unassembled. He says, do not, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves as the heathens do. He wants us to be a part of a church family so that we can learn and we can grow together to where we can bless each other. If that's you, why don't you come today and make St. Joseph your church home? By letter, professional faith, Christian experience. Why don't you come? Why don't you come? Why don't you come? Yes. Oh, yes. Why don't you come? Yes. Steadfast, unmovable, and confidence. Boy, I like that. I like that. You hope me today. You hope me. You hope me today. Uh, I hope y'all caught it. We don't know everything, but Jesus do. He knows everything. And he wants to be your helper. He wants to be the one that guides you through all the maze. He wants to be the one. Let us now prepare our hearts for worship and giving. And Father, again, we thank you for Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, the one who can take us through these troubles of life. Thank you now. Help us, teach us how to be steadfast and unmovable and confident in your word. Now as we take this offering, Lord, we ask that you would bless it, bless the givers, Bless those who don't have the gift, but their heart was fixed by you to come and sit in this Mother's Day. We thank you. Bless it for the upbuilding of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen.
Father, we do thank you for this offering. In Jesus' name, amen. Date. If you're interested, 
Friday, June 30th. So to make reservations, cutoff date is June uh, the 30th of this year. Information will be on the board as well. All righty, uh, let me see, is it hola, what is that, was it hello? Okay, yeah, I'm gonna stick with that, that's about all I can do. Because <laughs> St. Joseph is hosting a Spanish summer camp. Okay, I think I spoke on this last week, it's a blessing. Now there are some um, criterias, the uh, children are from the ages of five to ten, thank you pastor, five to ten, it is a two week summer camp from ages again, five to ten. The space is very limited. So if you have not already inquired about it, um, please do, there is a number associated. Um, the dates of this camp it is uh, June the 5th through June the 16th. It will be held from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. during those two weeks. This information is on the board. Again, limited space. Your baby is five to 10. You know, Pastor just spoke about between those ages up to six, that's when they absorb the most. So if we can, then please do for our babies. All right, mm -hmm. amen. All right, so as Pastor spoke, we did enjoy our Mother's Day brunch on yesterday. It was a blessing. You all were absolutely beautiful. It was the best time ever. So um, we like to thank you all that took the time to come, took the time to, uh, to assist. Um, it was a truly a blessing. Our pastor um, theme is for this uh for this church is love God, love man, and love the fellowship. And when I tell you it is coming to fruition, so I say to God be the glory. Special thanks, however. And if we, ha if I've missed anybody's name, please don't charge it to my heart, okay? Because you all stepped up, all right? But I want to start with our sister Carolyn Simmons. Grits was on it. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> My sister Betty Hackley, baby, I, did you rest your feet last night? Amen, praise God. Sister Corey Hackley, yes, ma'am, you did that. Sister Sadie Sutton, she always on point. She preached in, um, when she gave the uh, grace, but we thank you for it, Sister Sadie. <laughs> Sister Betty Tucker, working, working, working. Sister Sarah Hawkins. That's right, that's my girl. Oh, sweet Sister Norma Shepherd. Okay, Sister Carolyn Campbell, you did that. Daphne Mitchell, you are only girl. Okay, Joanne Simon, that's my sister, where you at? You did that. All right, uh, Sister uh, Sandretta Simmons, where my girl at? That's right, that's my girl, we did that, okay. <laughs> um, sister um, Machino, I'm gonna tell up your first name, is it Lorena? Thank you. I'm going, yes, you better know it, but you were there and you worked. We worked you. <laughs> Thank you. Sister Ballinger. Yes, my God. Sister Sandra Allen. That's my um, ministry leader right there. That's my sister. Thank me. Hey, Hope Jones. Sister Jeanette McKenzie. Looking good today, girl. You worked it. Okay. All right. Special, special thanks to our sister Kim Bacon. She um, always does an amazing job with the decor and what have you. Yes, she did. Yes, you did. You're looking good today, girl. Well, you always look good. But anyway. <laughs> All right. So let me also um, thank our men. Um, Brother Robert Brown attended and helped. Brother um, Stanley Limbrick, to God be the glory. Um, Brother um, Luckett, yes, he was attended, and uh, he was helping. His son, Antonio Luckett. Thank you, brother. Uh, Deacon Bacon, always standing up. Deacon Jones, yes, in the house. So if we forgot about anybody, please don't charge it to our hearts, but it was truly a blessing, so we thank you. However, the party don't stop, Pastor. We are going into um, our anniversary in the month of June. We have gone over the dates. Do I need to go over the dates again? Okay, y'all want me to do that, okay. All right, but if you have not, not paid your assessment fee, me, yeah, okay. All adults, um, members do have a 125 assessment <laughs> fee. We can pay it any way, you, any way, just title it anniversary, to God be the glory. But within that, on Father's Day, what is that, the 18th of June? Mm -hmm. Guess what? We celebrate you guys because you are more than worthy to be celebrated, to God be the glory. Yes, ordained from God to be. All right, so with that, uh, Father's Day appreciation, let me read. 
For our anniversary, we will have a Father's Day appreciation after morning worship on June 18th. All St. Joseph is invited to participate and attend. Bring your father, your sons, um, who are fathers who can, because uh, we would like to celebrate you all. Ladies, we will be celebrating um, our men at the church, so we are asking that if you are available to volunteer, please do support in any form or fashion. So see our very own sister um, Smith, Ruby Smith, if you can sign up and volunteer for that. All right. Now. Before you go for that, mm -hmm. honor. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. Bless you, Jesus. We are honoring our very own Chairman Emeritus, uh, Brother uh, Raph, Deacon Raph Smith, and uh, Deacon, what I said? Uh -huh, and Deacon Hackley. I was getting Amen. to him. <laughs> I promise I was going to get to him. We will be honoring them during this celebration for all the years of um, support and just staying steadfast in their ministry. So to God be the glory. Did not want to show it them. Now, I do have a celebration. <laughs> Y'all know I love to celebrate. All right. We have a graduate, um, folks. Y'all know that, right? Okay. So... Can I do, that's right, I was going to say, can I get him to stand up? Yes. <laughs> yes, the senior class of John Roberts Senior High School. I went to Terry Parker, so if I pronounced that wrong, I'm sorry. <laughs> Announces, yeah, Terry Parker, TP. Mm -hmm. Announces its commencement exercise on Wednesday afternoon. That is May the 31st of 2023 at 1 o'clock at the University of North Florida Arena. However, have more information about that. Look at look at our baby. Look at our baby Octavius. Okay. All right, Octavius Jared Julian Woods. Okay, of Rebound Senior High School, graduation May the thirty first. But guess what? He will be attending University of Central Florida, and he will major in computer science. That's our baby St. Joseph. To God be the glory. Yes. Yes. Congratulations, not only to him, but to anybody's baby who is graduating, because it is a blessing. Oh, bless you, Jesus. So I thank you. Um, I think that's going to be it. I'm going to get from up here, but that uh, concludes my announcement for today. Again, happy Mother's Day, you all. Thank you. <laughs> he 18. Why are you getting old, boy? Yeah, he 18. What the, well, I'm going to leave that alone. To Pastor Gregory in the pulpit, Sister Ruby Smith, can I see you a minute, please? Here's the thing. Sister Smith, yesterday, it was beautiful to all of everybody who worked hard. It was beautiful. And we know you had so much help, but it started with you. And we thank God just for your many gifts that you have and that you're not selfish. You share them with the church and you make sure that everybody is included. And we thank you for that because you don't have to do that. And we know that when we so you see your phone number, we know we're fixing to work. <laughs> we know she's gonna call us, you got something to do, but it's all for St. Joseph. And truly you have taken love God, love man, love the fellowship to the next level. And as our pastor said this morning, your labor is not in vain. And we just want to say thank you. And God bless you. Amen, amen. Uh, 
I am uh, uh, Sister Hope Jones' uh, agent, so if y'all need a good hype man, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's her, so y'all can, y'all can see me, you know, we'll get her engaged. <laughs> but I, I am still celebrating from yesterday. That Mother's Day, that, that was, you know, there was so much joy, and I wasn't allowed to come back around, although all the noise, I thought they were sacrificing a husband or something in there, you know, with all the, the loud laughter and, and yelling and everything, so, but anyway, it was, I'm, I'm so glad, I was so happy to see that fellowship, and from other, all of other churches and so forth, were all apart, so it was just a beautiful thing. And that's what we want to see continuing, is, is loving the fellowship, loving God first, loving each other, and, in, and loving the fellowship. That's, that's where we are. That's where we are. Um, with that, I don't think there's anything else. Uh, no more announcements. Well, let us stand and let us begin our enjoyment. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Come on, come on. Okay. St. Joseph, uh, real quick, I know this brother Octavius is going off to college, and my job as a longshoreman, we give scholarships to all the serving, this deserving high school students and college students that meet the requirements, and the check is cut into the child's name, not the institution. And I would like for anyone who have a student going to college or if they're already in college that would like to get a scholarship for school, please get in touch with me this week because the deadline is the end of this month. And I think DDB are our essential some information for him already, but I'll send it to you again for him to get some of that money because I would like for St. Joseph's Amen. youth to be able to reap the benefits for that. All right? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Daryl. Good afternoon. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms in the sanctuary. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Pastor Bradbury. The Mother's Day Committee, under the leadership of Sister Gibson, would like to honor you with a little gift bag. Sister Gibson and the committee want you to know that God sees you, we appreciate you, we honor and celebrate you for the timeless and limitless jobs you do as a mom. We wish, we wish you a day full of relaxation, love, and your favorite dessert. Now with all the mothers, please raise your hand. We have a little gift bag.
everybody to see our new baby, right? Everybody got quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> she is so adorable. She is so adorable. Oh, that's Deacon Jones' grandbaby. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Did my baby get to Sunday school this morning? She didn't get to? Oh, okay. Okay. Poor thing. She was broken hearted last week. She wanted to get to Sunday school, and mom had a meeting, and Man, she was carrying on. Glad to see smiling faces today. With that, we're going to stand. I pray that everyone will enjoy the rest of their Mother's Day. And uh, just have a good time, but just be safe in all that you do. Keep Jesus first. mothers know that their labor is not in vain. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the president of his court with exceeding great joy to the only wise God of majesty, power, dominion, both now and ever, and all of God's people should say today, Amen and praise the Lord. Amen. 